Well, welcome and good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see you. This is our first live event in two years. It's, there's nothing like being with other people, right? It's totally different experience. So good to see you. Um, uh, my name is Stephen Menendian. I am the Director of Research at the Othering and Belonging Institute, and it's a real privilege to moderate this discussion today and presentation with uh, Professor Cashin. Um, the, this is a really important topic. Let me give you the quick formal bios, and I'll add a quick note, and then we'll have Professor Cashin come up here to preview her exciting book. So Cheryl Cashin is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law civil rights and social justice at Georgetown University. She is an acclaimed author who writes about the US struggle with racism and inequality. Her books, which there are many and are on the back table here, only a few of them are back there relative to her uh, output, um, has been nominated for the NAACP Image Award for Nonfiction, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Nonfiction, and an editor's choice in the New York Times Book Review. She is an active member of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council and was a law clerk to US Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. She also worked in the Clinton White House as an advisor on community development in inner city neighborhoods. She is a contributing editor for Politico magazine where she writes phenomenal articles. Google Politico Cashin and you won't be disappointed. and um, resides in Washington, D.C. with her husband and twin sons. You can follow her at CherylCashin.com and on Twitter at Cheryl Cashin. Also joining her this afternoon for what is going to be just a remarkable and deeply insightful conversation is John A. Powell, the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute. He is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of civil rights, civil liberties, structural racism, housing, poverty, and democracy. He, uh, at the Institute, he brings together scholars, community advocates, communicators, and policymakers to identify and eliminate barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society. He holds the Robert D. Haas Chancellor's Chair in Equity and Inclusion and is a professor of law, African American studies, and ethnic studies. Previously, he was the executive director of the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and at the Ohio State University where he held the Gregory H. Williams Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. I was also going to uh, reference how Cheryl described him in her book, but I couldn't find the quote on the fly. I think she called him a champion of opportunity and a visionary uh, leader, which I can attest to as well. Before I invite Professor Cashin up here, I just want to note that um, what a remarkable and unique voice she is, and an important voice in this moment. Um, I, we, I try and read about a book on race every month, and I can pick out her voice just by reading a passage. It's so important and so unique. And she has such an important, clear perspective and a powerful case that she's making in this book. So I, I just couldn't be more excited to invite her up here to share her thoughts and her argument. So without further ado. Thank you so much, Steve. That's so kind of you. I feel like I'm coming home because, um, you know, it was like 20 years ago with my first book, this man invited me to speak at uh, Ohio State. And you were there too, I believe, right? And I, 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 I come, I'd never met him before, and this man it looks like Moses. Right, <laughs> and when I was speaking and talking to him, it felt like you know he should have written the book because he already knew everything about the subject. And as you'll see, there's a lot, a lot of your work on opportunity housing. And Stephen, your work is cited there. You guys have been such a uh, uh, leading lights for me. I'll say that. And I, I also I have to recognize a dear old friend. It's been 40 years. Forty years ago, we were graduate students at, at Oxford. My friend Jeff Gibbs, who's um, he's a, a Cal Berkeley uh, Law School alum, but he's also special counsel to the university, and I'm very moved that he came out. And I'm, I'm going to be shouting out to someone else um, special uh, in the end of my presentation, and you'll see him here. So let me get started. Um, and I want thank you. So tech people, 
uh, it has gone off. Maybe it's, let me see if I can get it back up. Control Alt Delete. Where's the delete? There we go. I don't know the passwords, Mark. <laughs> And I also want to just thank you guys for coming out. It's, it's really, really wonderful um, for you to take your time to be here. And then I understand we have quite a group online uh, watching us right now. So thank you. All right. Well, let me dive in. Um, in this book, I argue that each time this country seems to have put to bed a peculiar black subordinating institution, it has created another one uh, from slavery to Jim Crow. I could have included mass incarceration in there to the iconic ghetto, which I use, I, I, I prefer to say hood, which is a term of affection for me, but technically a ghetto is any neighborhood where more than 40% of the people who live there are poor. Um, it's, but you know, it's also a, 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 a cultural uh, uh, stereotype. But each of these peculiar anti-black institutions are, have been animated by a dogma, a stereotype that's designed to justify um, maintaining, creating and maintaining the institution. Uh, all of them obviously are institutions of white supremacy. This book is about the peculiar experience of black Americans subordinated by segregation and what I call residential caste. It was created to contain black Americans, but all of us today are ensnared by it. Okay, and so you know, what is residential caste? I said that we, um, my shorthand, uh, we in this country, we government, uh, overinvests and excludes an affluent white space and disinvests and contains and frankly preys on people in high poverty black and brown spaces. Those are the extremes of residential caste, but everybody in between those two extremes um, ha has quite, quite a bit of difficulty accessing opportunity because of three persistent current anti-black processes, boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and surveillance. And you know, it took me two decades to figure this out. I am a, 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 a law professor. I'm also a self-taught historian. And I also happen to have a, de a degree in electrical engineering, right? And I, I brought a systems analysis to um, uh, try, try to understand this. Uh, OK, so to, I'm going to make it easy for you. Um, took me two decades to figure this out. My law school came up with this beautiful video which tells the story of residential caste in four minutes. Um, and I'm going to do, play the video for you, and that'll make it much easier for me to talk about other details. Let's hope this works. OK, here we go. Opportunity. If, if high OK, opportunity wait a minute. We have to go back to the beginning. Here we go. America's residential caste is destroying Can you hear it? opportunity. If, if high opportunity is sequestered only in certain places, Neither cities, nor struggling suburbs, nor far out rural hamlets are an engine of opportunity in this country anymore. We're not the land of opportunity in this system of residential caste. So I've been a professor at Georgetown Law for 25 years. And I've written a new book, White Space, Black Hood opportunity hoarding and segregation in the age of inequality. And in that book, I'm shining a light on American residential caste. So American residential caste is a system that was intentionally constructed to create affluent white spaces separated and apart from high poverty black neighborhoods. We overinvest in and exclude in affluent white space and we disinvest and prey upon the people trapped in the hood. So there are three anti-black processes that undergird residential caste. Boundary maintenance, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. 
Boundary maintenance is a polite word for segregation. The most persistent types of neighborhoods in large metropolitan or even medium metropolitan areas is affluent white space and high poverty minority neighborhoods, particularly black neighborhoods. They have persisted and the boundaries to those two types of neighborhoods have gotten harder. We're more segregated now um, than we were 20 years ago at these polar extremes. Opportunity hoarding is over investing in affluent majority white space uh, and disinvesting elsewhere, particularly in black neighborhoods. We tend to, you know, use exclusionary zoning, neighborhood assignment, the boundaries of jurisdictions to hoard the opportunities there. Golden infrastructure in schools, wonderful transportation, job-rich social networks. Everyone else who's excluded from those high opportunity environments subsidizes that, right? Through taxation, through gasoline taxes, that gorgeous golden infrastructure is paid for and subsidized by the people who are excluded. And then the third is stereotype-driven surveillance by police and by private citizens. As with slavery and Jim Crow, um, a lot of non-black citizens have been conscripted into policing back bodies. Stereotype-driven surveillance is driven by this idea that that, that kind of behavior is deserved. In, in majority black neighborhoods. Police go through there with a the lens, uh, you know, every young man is presumed a thug rather than a citizen. The beauty of, once you understand the processes, they actually provide the way forward. You basically abolish and reverse them. Inclusion rather than exclusion with boundary maintenance. Uh, giving historically defunded neighborhoods priority in investing rather than opportunity hoarding and, and disinvesting in blackness. Humanization and care, rather than stereotype-driven surveillance. A city that's gone through abolition repair, what I imagine and envision is that they will have returned to being engines of opportunity, particularly for poor people in poor neighborhoods. See them as assets and give them a chance to be an agent in their own liberation. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and I thought it was easier to play the video with my sort of um, uh, tired self. I got in very late last night. But let me just say a few more things and then we can begin the discussion. Go back to um, slideshow and play from the current slide. It's all good, right? All right. <laughs> okay, so coming to uh, residential cast, how many of you have read The Color of Law? Okay, quite a few people. I'd like to have some of his mojo, right? <laughs> In terms of book sales. So uh, thank you for being here. But so, a lot of, the, 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 here's the point. The primary response to millions of black American great migrants uh, leaving the South to escape Jim Crow, moving North, Midwest, and West was to contain them in their own neighborhoods. Um, the color of law talks about that. I'm not going to get in all to the nuts and bolts, but um, federal and state and local policies intentionally contain black people, and then they marked their neighborhoods as hazardous, marking blackness as hazardous. Uh, that's redlining. Um, and for you know, eight, nine decades on, we have a, a site of a Fed study in my book which shows that the black neighborhoods marked as hazardous eight decades on, they uh, correlate with disinvestment to this day and segregation, all right? And what happens is um, people associate uh, the conditions in those neighborhoods with the black people who live there. And we tell stories to justify that. Um, and, and so, you know, as with previous institutions, we have stereotypes to justify to to to, to justify laws and policies, um, and then people, uh, the average average people, um, get conscripted in those stereotypes, um, um, and so it becomes self-perpetuating. Once you institutionalize an anti-black institution, it becomes very very hard to disrupt it. 
Um, all right, so boundary maintenance. This map uh, illustrates better than anything else, I think, and I have it in the book, um, what I'm talking about. This is Houston. Every yellow star on there is a housing project subsidized by the low income housing tax credit. Every blue star is a public housing project. And um, the pale area is the majority, the majority white area of Western um, Houston, right? And, it's, and I can show you a map like this in most major metropolitan areas, right? And it, it's tend, and that you see highways is something physical, either a highway or a river or a mountain that you know uh, tend to be boundaries between white and and black space. Um, and I talk about this in the book. Uh, they had never built a public housing project anywhere in white space uh, in, city, in the city of Houston. And um, in fact, in a lawsuit, the um, city, in, as part of a settlement, admitted that they had concentrated more than 71% of all government subsidized housing in only five of its 88 neighborhoods, right? And if you remember nothing else that I've said here, concentrated black poverty is an intentional government-sponsored institution. And you would not, and this is the central message of my book, right? You could not have affluent, poverty-free white space without concentrating poverty elsewhere. So all of the pol policies that concentrate poverty by, are by design also constructing affluent white space. Right, um, and places like this have the best of everything, um, and you 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 you, you uh, I know or at least have some sense of what the hood is like. So that's boundary maintenance, right? But what what do I do in my in my book? Um, uh, and thank you for mentioning my voice, right? Uh, I bring a lot of personal passion to this uh, project. I'm a daughter of civil rights advocates from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I try to show that you. Know, there's never been any group in the world that's been oppressed that doesn't mount resistance, right? And so I feature my people, and I refer to my people as descendants. And let me be very specific. I'm talking about black American descendants of slavery, right? I am, I am that. Um, I'm descendants of enslaved and, and slave owners. Um, but uh, I call the people trapped in the hood, in particular descendants, which for me is a term of affection, to, in acknowledging the unbroken continuum from slavery, right? Um, and then I show some of our descendant freedom fighters. Every, almost every chapter starts with uh, examples. And so these, these are two guys. I start with uh, Baltimore, chapter one. Why did I choose Baltimore as my case study in American cast. You know, Baltimore was the city with like the highest free black urban population during the antebellum era, right? That's what turned Frederick Douglass on. Frederick Douglass saw these free people walking around and said, I want some of that, right? Um, and black people, black Americans living in Baltimore at the turn of the century could buy houses wherever they wanted, they could go in the stores, they could try them on. There was no regime of caste oppressing them. Um, you know, but it's only with the Great Migration and the hysteria when black people start to arrive in larger and larger numbers that uh, racial zoning and all these other things happen. Well, I feature this guy, W. Ashby Hawkins, was, who was Thurgood Marshall before there was any Thurgood Marshall, right? Um, showing him, these are both lawyers, they're brothers-in-law, and George W. F. McKechn, right? He had the temerity to buy one of the finest homes on one of the finest blocks in, in Baltimore, and that's what got the whole uh, uh, thing started. Um, and I show them as, as, as resistance fighters, um, and all the way st straight through. Um, I show the cumulative blunt force trauma that the black neighborhoods of the butterfly, east-west Baltimore, called to this day the black butterfly, in contrast to the white L, which goes right through. Um, Baltimore has been led by a series of black mayors. To this day, Baltimore, um, the majority of uh, blacks uh, on the city council are, are black. 
Um, and yet they found, when they did their own equity analysis, that they were spending four times as much resources in white areas to their own horror, right? Now they're trying to disrupt it, and that's what I'm talking about, these systems. But I, I show the, all, all of that, right? Um, yes? Can you go back and, and make clear the residential pattern of segregation? What do you mean? In Baltimore? Yeah, in Baltimore. What do you mean? This is east and west, but, oh, I'm sorry. The darker it is, the blacker it is. Is that, is that not clear? All right, so and this over here is the HOLC red line map. It's from the 30s, which marked all of the black neighborhoods with red, with a D. I apologize. Is that is it clear now? Okay. All right. Maps in the book. <laughs> you can get in the back. Okay. You know, it's what's cumulative blood force trauma. So you get the Negro removal, and you get highways. This is the highway to nowhere, um, uh, which was run through a black neighborhood and stopped by Barbara Mikulski. Um, uh, I, I just show this story, and then I, I kind of show the struggle of, Amer you know, the uh, black American belonging, um, the Tulsa, the Watts riots, aren't those, this is, this is white people rioting, killing black people, this is black people rioting after police attack them. Um, but again, I show uh, descendants, Dorothy Cattrall, a woman I interviewed and spent a chapter on, who's uh, Lakia Barnett, who's a client of a, a healthcare clinic at our law school, who was, you know, a married mother of three who found herself homeless, um, and I show her Kafka-esque battle just to find some decent, stable housing in Washington D.C., even though she had a prized HUD voucher. All right, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not I just to cover the sweep of the book. Um, um, this is Dr. Daryl Atwell, a Howard-trained anesthesiologist. He leads the chapter on black surveillance. I show what his uh, experience is like um, um, being preyed upon by police, uh, even though he doesn't live in the hood. And then the final chapter, which is entitled Abolition and Repair, leads with the story of Devone Bogan, who is in the room. Raise your hand, Devone. There he is, right? Um, and, and I must say, so Devone Boggin, who's, who's the uh, descendant of great migrants, um, um, where was it from, Devone? From, what was it, from Alabama? What, from Alabama to Albion, Michigan, right? Um, but it, Richmond, California was experiencing um, some of the worst gun violence in the country. Um, worse than Chicago, and this guy saw the young men who were likely to pull the trigger with a lens of love. And, and my point with abolition and repair is that the first thing we need to do is change the lens by which we see black people um, from presumed thug to presumed citizen. And once you do that, it frees you up to pursue evidence-based strategies that are likely to be more effective and cheaper than the predation um, that's visited upon black people. So Devone um, um, saw the young men in Richmond who were most likely to pursue, to, to, to pull the trigger as the most potentially powerful change agents. And he saw that them as three-dimensional human beings worthy of love and capable of transformation. There was only about two dozen of them, right? Um, and what do they do? They wrap them in love you know, a 24-7, 18-month peacemaker fellowship, which cost, uh, I think they seeded it with about a million dollars. What do they get? A 55% reduction in gun violence, right? Meanwhile, and I'll end with this so we can have our conversation. Um, the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, spends a million dollars per inner city block every four years to incarcerate people there, right? Uh, this is an issue of valuing black people um, uh, rather than just money, right? And I'll end with this, right? I thought when I was, I was finishing this book in 2020, um, and as I was concluding it, I thought the hardest step in terms of transformation or abolition repair would be the first one, getting people to see black people is it, it, with, with a lens of something other than fear. Um, 
And this gave me hope. Yeah, it's been a couple of years and, 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 and we, we got backlash and struggle, but it still is the case that I think that a critical mass of people, of, of non-black people, want something better than residential caste and a society premised on separation, fear, and frankly, violence. And I'll stop there. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is John Powell. Um, and I had the pleasure of not only reading Cheryl Cashman, but also knowing Cheryl Cashman. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she is really a powerful thinker. And we have already participated in a number of struggles together. Um, so I'm just going to make a few comments, uh, and then we're going to have a discussion back and forth. Uh, this is actually not only a powerful book, it's actually emotional in many ways. Um, so I woke up this morning, I'll take it back a little bit, and I got a, a text uh, email from Phil Tegler. I don't know if you got that email. About Mike, Mike. Right, right, right. Uh, about Mike Miller. That's most of you probably don't know who Mike is, but you've been influenced by his work. Economist, you wrote a book called Respect, uh, but he just died. Um, and I was sitting on another email, getting um, ready to respond that another friend, Tom Henderson, had also recently died. Uh, Mike Miller was 98 years old, uh, Tom was 69. Uh, and they both, in a sense, were involved in the struggles that Cheryl talks about. Um, also, and so I haven't really processed it, so I'm sharing it with you right now. Uh, and part of the reason that's important is that this is, as someone said, not a sprint, not a marathon, a relay. We have to hand it on to the next generation and the next generation. Because this, this has been going on for a long time, and it's going to be going on. Um, and it was also just reading about Cheryl's incredible family. So, ooh, you know, uh, I've written a couple of books, but I haven't brought my family in. So you've already inspired me to sort of start talking about my family in the books more. Uh, but uh, this is an incredible, incredible family. And, and I think many uh, Americans, but especially black Americans, have these untold stories uh, about the resistance and heroes. And, uh, and so I want to thank you for sharing that with us uh, and continuing the legacy of your incredible family. Thank you so much. Um, but as we sort of think about this legacy, you know, and Cheryl said, I, I spent a lot of time in Baltimore. And uh, so the cases and the people that are highlighted in the book, uh, Stephen and I spent hours working on the Thompson case. Uh, out of Baltimore. Uh, and in many ways, it was the first federal court case where the court applied opportunity mapping, uh, which is something that we helped bring to the fore uh, in the 90s, but then continue to use. And, and now it's become uh, more of an industry standard. So people like Raj Chetty and others around the country and the federal government now use it. And, and and the whole notion of opportunity hoarding. Uh, and so one of the things that we did in that work and continue to do, because people, there's a debate about segregation. A lot of people get confused. It's like, why do you, so, what, so what if it's segregated? Um, you know, black people have their neighborhood, white people have their neighborhood, Latinos, Native Americans. What's wrong with that? Um, and it's never simply been about the separation of people. It's been about the distribution of opportunity. And what Cheryl reminds us is that it's race, class, and geography. And oftentimes we miss the geography part. And we wonder out loud, well, you know, why don't we just leave black people in West Oakland or Richmond or East Oakland or uh, East Palo Alto or Detroit or Baltimore and just invest in it? 
Just put more money in it. The whole purpose of segregation is to deplete opportunity. It's opportunity stripping and, and to take that money and then invest it in white communities. So people ask that question, and it sounds like a reasonable question, but it's clear when we ask that question, we don't understand the whole function and purpose of segregation, because we focus on the people. So what's well, black people over here, white people over here, you know, white people segregated too, not in terms of being stripped of opportunity. They're overinvested. Um, I grew up in Detroit, and I'm going back there for Thanksgiving. Uh, and many of you heard me talk about my incredible family in Detroit. You go to Detroit now and there, I mean, it's, it's like maddening what you see. You see the Woodward Quarter, all this money being invested. And uh, billionaires building stadiums. And when they build stadiums, for the most part, the first thing they do is they say, we need public subsidy. We need help. I'm a billionaire but I need help to build a football stadium that will not serve black people. Um, when they had one of the big mega sports events in, in Detroit, um, they literally told black Detroiters to stay away. This is basically, this is, Detroit is the blackest large city in the United States. It was 85% black. I don't know what the data is right now. And so they're investing their money, stripping their assets, to have a big brouhaha in Detroit and tell the black people, can you not come downtown for a few days? Um, Y'all might scare the white people. Uh, so the other thing I want to pick, pick up on that's really important. So one, the first is that, again, segregation is about opportunity. It's not simply about people. It's about how we distribute opportunity. So we have opportunity stripping and opportunity hoarding. Those two things go together. And for years, we studied concentrated poverty and the racial dimensions of concentrated poverty. And what Cheryl is telling us, that we can't study concentrated poverty without understanding its relationship to concentrated wealth. Those two things are related. So here's the second thing I really want to lift up. The relationship. The relationship. These are critically interdynamic processes. So a lot of times we think we're talking about black people or the black condition, because it's not just people. We're really talking about white people and the white condition. So when we're studying East Oakland, Richmond, we're studying the hills of Berkeley and the hills of, and, and, and beautiful neighborhoods in San Francisco. There's a powerful relationship. Uh, so when we are studying what's happening in Hunter's Point, we're also studying what's happening in Elmwood, Berkeley. These things are related. And that's the thing that we keep missing. That the conditions of segregation in a country and black and white people in particular, all people, all people, but particularly black and white people in terms of our history, is powerfully interrelated. And that's part of the hope and also the fear. Because in a sense, Whiteness has always been about constructing a separate space for white people. So the containment. Uh, if we're going to have black people, y'all go over there. Uh, and don't go too far because we need you to come work in our homes, in our neighborhoods. We need you to take care of our children. So don't go too far, just far enough. Uh, so the construction of the black hood In white space, it's the same phenomena. It's the same phenomena. Uh, and I guess the, the last point I want to make, the relationship point is really, really important. I just finished 
just about finished teaching a class on critical race theory. Uh, we just had an election, and think about this election. And you know, I know this is not partisan, and I don't know what your political affiliation, but I would say the new party of white supremacy did pretty well. In the era of George Floyd, the new party of white supremacy, they rebranded re themselves, now they call themselves the Republicans. Uh, they used to be called the Democrats, they used to be called the Dixiecrats, uh, but they've always had the same ideology, maintaining and protecting white supremacy. And I want to be clear, this is not the same as white people. This is, a, this is an ideology where the elites organize fear, weaponize fear. And so just read the paper. They're talking about uh, Trump, the attack on white suburban women. What's the attack, Trump? They want to move affordable housing into the suburbs. And Trump tells you. That's, that's an attack on suburban white women. He, he doesn't hide it. It's not a dog whistle. He's explicit. We're trying to maintain white space, and Obama and some of those people were trying to disrupt that space. So we still have this dynamic going on that sometimes we don't fully understand, that this, that this is a powerful relationship. And so one of the threats become you're going to lose your hoarded, resource because black people are going to be able to move in. And then, well, what's so wrong with that? What's so scary about that? We still are trading in these stereotypes about black people, criminals, thugs, dangerous. Uh, and so you saw the clip, I think that was Central Park, right, uh, where a black guy with a Harvard degree can't go look at birds because he's dangerous. And a liberal white Canadian understands that. She didn't take Cheryl's class, she didn't take my class, but she understands that you can call the state, the power of the state down on any black person, on a black man, if you just use the right words. White woman in trouble. She doesn't have to say white woman, she has a white voice. But she does say, she does say, an African American is threatening me. So the relationship is quite powerful. I want to end and have a conversation, but it's not all bad. Uh, we have people struggling, as Cheryl suggested, to do something different. Uh, but I think we don't always understand the struggle. The struggle is to usher in something new. Um, as far as I know, and I may be wrong on this, as far as I know, there's not been one major lawsuit of white students suing because they're segregated from black students. Right? The court talks about this as a, almost symmetrical. You know, you, know, you know, it's just one group against the other. No, it's, there's a power relationship. So you look at the desegregation suits, they're always people of color suing. And what they're suing for is complicated. They're suing for integration of schools, not desegregation, if they're doing it right, integration of schools. And part of that entails the integration of resources. So again, some people get confused and they say, well, just give us the resources and keep the people over there. The resources and the people are closely tied to each other. And the elites understand that. They understand the symbolism of saying, these people not only want to just live in your neighborhood, go to your schools, they want to take your resources that you worked so hard to get. Uh, so th the future. The future is for us to actually consciously, deliberately swim upstream and construct a society and world with a different way of organizing space. Douglas Massey, in a really important book, uh, Categorically Unequal, he talks about we have different mechanisms for reinstituting essentially white supremacy. 
And the most, one of the most important ones right now, if not the most important one, is space. Space is doing a lot of work. Now, this system is so insidious that I'm not convinced that if we crack the space problem, there wouldn't be a new problem. That's one of the things Cheryl is telling us is that, you know, we crack Jim Crow. We crack the wall, you know, all right, we don't have Jim Crow anymore. The drinking fountains aren't black and white, but the prisons are. So we get mass incarceration. We crack slavery, not entirely, because that's that exception in the 13th Amendment. And that exception becomes the rule, uh, and we get Jim Crow. So I'm not entirely convinced that if we crack the spatial dimension, the geographic dimension, that these clever people wouldn't come up with a fourth way of reinserting. But we have to be diligent and mindful and be clear on what it is we're trying to do. Uh, we aren't just trying to end segregation. We aren't just trying to end mass incarceration. We aren't just trying to end slavery. We're trying to end the whole practice and domination of white supremacy. That's the charge, which is actually a deep charge because it means not only organizing space differently, it means organizing identities differently. It means organizing our stories differently. It means organizing our monies differently. And that all of us are implicated. All of us are involved in that struggle. I'll tell you one quick story, then I'll stop. Got con contacted by a school system when Trump was in the White House. And they were being sued. This was before the critical race theory. I mean, think about this. Republicans are trying to ride the country back to dominance with its main agenda. It's, you could say three things. Anti-government, race, and critical race theory. That's it. That's their agenda. And that's working. And it's working. And we have to, anyway. So think about, so I got a call from the school system and said, we need help. What's, what's the help you need? Um, we're being sued because we're teaching about the history of slavery, the history of Jim Crow, the history of colonialization, the history of genocide among Native Americans. And some of our parents are saying, we're teaching to hate white people. We're, when we talk about white supremacy and white dominance, they're saying, that's synonymous with saying, we hate white people, we hate America. Can you help us? And what I said is that, so look, this is what I think you should do, and then if this doesn't work, call me. And then I'll call Denise. <laughs> What you are challenging is the notion of dominance and superiority, writ large, not just in terms of white people, but you are challenging the notion that any people, black, white, brown, any religion, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, is superior and has the right to dominate others. And you can anchor that in some of our founding documents like the Declaration of Independence. Make it clear that this is not abstractly against white people, this is against dominance, this is against superiority, that's the operative word. Whiteness is not the operative word. Whiteness is descriptive of a larger word of dominance and superiority. And if they wanna argue, and some will feel this way, but they may not argue, that no, white people have a right to dominate and should dominate, that's an argument that you can win. That's the argument you should engage in. And that's what they did. And the people dropped the suit. Uh, and so the hard thing that, I want, that I'm trying to leave you with is that this is profoundly interrelated and it's the dominance that we actually want to challenge. Uh, and the way that dominance is expressed will continue to change. But if you look for dominance of one group, racial group over the other, that won't change unless we actually move it into something much more inclusive, much more a sense of belonging, where everybody belongs. And in doing that, it's important not to get lost on the people themselves. That the idea of white supremacy is not the same as white people. That in our world that we're trying to construct, and I think that Cheryl is trying to construct, uh, Cheryl is, trying, is that is one of everybody belongs 
and opportunity is appropriately shared among all the people. So it's not saying one group over the other, uh, but it's saying that everybody belongs. Uh, and no one can call the government because those people are here in a white space where they don't belong. If it's a white space, then everybody who's not white is suspect. And many of us have had that experience. Literally, when I was a student here at Berkeley, I got arrested for being a black body on a white campus. And I had to call Richard Buxbaum, who's still here at Berkeley, uh, and he had to vouch for me that I was a student, not a thug. I might have been both, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and it was just a story two days ago, and then I'll stop, Stephen, turn to you, and you can... That's two days ago, a white woman tra traveling with her biracial kid on Southwest Airlines, uh, one of the stewardess sees this white woman with a black kid and thinks something suspicious is going on and calls the police. And they investigate. What the hell are you doing with this black kid? I'm her mother. Hmm. Is this America? Go ahead. Unfortunately, it is. <laughs> I, I'm happy to open it up. I mean, there's so many things I could say, but we would just be reinforcing each other. And I would love, you think, ready for us to take questions? So I want to remind everyone who's online watching this through the video stream that we're going to take your questions. So please uh, type your questions in the chat. We're also going to take questions from the audience. But I um, just wanted to give you one more time to respond to anything John said, or to, to reemphasize any other points you want to make? I just want to reemphasize that residential caste is about power, right? It's, it's not just about, you know, love or seeing, living with each other. As you said, I really want to re emphasize that point. When you set up concentrated abundance and concentrated communities of need, and y'all all, all in, know where high opportunity space is and where everybody does, right? You have a direct competition for limited public and private resources, and p elites regularly use their influence to bend not only public investment, but private investment to their will. And we live in a society, and you see it over and over, where it feels more and more like everything is constructed for what elites want. You know, I'm in I'm D.C. and it's, there's so much redevelopment and, you know, all the new developments, luxury, 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 right? I, I have three degrees and I walk, the, the walk some of these areas and I feel uncomfortable, right? So um, that, that's the point. Great. Well, let's, let's open it up for some questions. I have some questions in my back pocket if we have time. So um, who would like to start? We've got a, a roving mic and then we'll take some questions from online. Just raise your hand. All right, right here in the middle. And tell us who you are. Hello, I, my name is Allie Lutz, and thank you, thank you, thank you. My question is, could you talk about um, congressional districting and if that plays a role here? You're talking about gerrymandering? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. Right, so the, the uh, social distinctions that come naturally to people become much more efficient when you overlay geography. So it's not just I, I'm uncomfortable with individuals like that. It's like you see a neighborhood and it's so much easier to say those people over there, whatever, right? And then, you know, when you overlay it with politics, right? We have segregated school districts. We increasingly have boundaries that separate affluence from regularness, right? Well, more and more, a lot of the geographic boundaries reflect that, right? And it's, it's much easier when you're districting to, to pay attention to that as you're drawing lines. Well, my people are over here. Their people are over there. Let's shove all everybody into, you know, their people into that district, which will ensure 
that my people, I, I get to run only with my people, right? So, and then our politics, surprise, surprise, becomes much more toxic and extreme, and it's the primaries that determine the dominant narratives, right? And on the right, and you're right, when I, you know, in Alabama, as late as 1964, when you walk into the voting booth, um, the official slogan of the Democratic Party was, white supremacy for the right, right? It was the official organizing slogan for a hundred years in the South, right? And it's become, you know, kind of a, a unofficial, but not so, not, not so dog whistled, but, but explicitly said uh, on the right, at least white identity stoking white division. It's, it's easier to do that when people live separate or and apart from others and have no intimate experience with people who walk different lives. John. Mm -hmm. So just to reinforce on just one other thing that Cheryl said in terms of um, gerrymandering in part is largely about power. And so and it's also bizarre. Uh, um, and the court has said, yeah, gerrymandering has something to do with race. That's, that's okay. But when they tried to create districts to really protect the black vote, O'Connor and others said, that's not okay. She said, when, you just, when it's just about race, and almost all the cases that struck down drawing district boundaries would have empowered people of color, the courts have been very skeptical. You can't use race for this purpose. But I mean, you can use race when you're constructing a white district. Uh, and so I just taught this, and, and when you read it, it's like the inconsistency is staggering. Uh, you know, that the court has an agenda, and the agenda is used by both parties, but more by the Republican parties. I mean, I think you know that on a different level, the Senate is 50-50, only 38% of the voting population supported the Republicans. Um, and the majority of people, vast majority of people, supported Democrats in the House, but the Democrats are holding on by a thread. Uh, and then Everybody knows that the redistricting, they'll use all the tools they can, the algorithms, the computers, to construct districts. And part of it's just about power. But the power that we're talking about is profoundly racialized. The Republicans, for, for certainly since Trump, but if not before then, has decided that it's going to ride the, the ideology of white supremacy and white resentment as long as it possibly can. And the only thing I would add to that is that for us not to get into that, you resent me, I'm going to resent you, and for us to actually turn that into, well, if Republicans are a party of white people, then what about the 43% of white people who don't support the Republican Party? Where do they go? Uh, and that's about the number. It's about 43% of white voters don't support the Republican Party. Uh, and I'm suggesting that they, in relationship, in relationship with the rest of the country has to help forge a different possibility. Great question. Um, in the back. Cheryl, you've made a very powerful framework, explanatory framework for opportunity and learning, and you refer to it as Hi, people online. Uh, <laughs> you refer to it in terms of government action to enforce residential segregation. It's a wonderful term. It also applies to the private actors that you refer to differently. And the most um, explanatory piece I've ever seen was within the past month in the New York Times, a lady, she talks about access to good life in America is really access to high paying jobs. She goes through a factory, she takes it back to 1925 basically, looks at a framework through women, a white male, and a black male, okay? Women, 1925, the industrial revolution in this country starts high paying factory jobs. They're not even allowed in the factory. Okay? The black men are allowed in the north, but they're allowed only as janitors. Okay? And the black men go to the white foreman and say, well, we'd like to have a chance to be on the shop floor too, which is high, more highly paid. The shop foreman says to him, says straight to his face, well, we can't do that because if we give you and the other black men one of these jobs, they can't go to our sons and nephews and cousins. 
And there you go right there. And so if you can tie this in to the opportunity hoarding that occurs through private actors in terms of jobs, education, everything, you will have explained the whole the whole kit and caboodle, as they say. Well, I couldn't do it all in 20 minutes, but I'll say uh, high poverty neighborhoods, um, particularly high poverty neighborhoods of color, invariably are like 180 degrees away from the job rich centers, right? And a lot of those people are transportation dependent. You know, they, they, they you know, it could take 90 minutes even to get there. Right? So they're cut off from economic opportunity. They are as cut off as the previous system of race-based caste where they said, no, these jobs are for us. Right? So res today, geography kind of plays that role uh, uh, that it played in the past of cutting people out of economic opportunity. And I'm going to stop there so other people can get questions in. Any question questions over here? Then we'll take one online. Thank you. Um, my name is Leah Murray, and this is my husband, Ramon Quintana. And we actually do homelessness work with the unhoused in the city of Richmond. And so um, this is really near and dear to my heart. I'm wondering if you can relate the residential caste system um, with homelessness and race. And my other question is, how do you do this work without your stomach continually turning over? Okay, so um, I'm not an expert on homelessness, um, but just from reading the paper, the impression I get is that uh, in California, many if not most of the homeless people are people of color. A lot of them are mental patients, right? But, and that's not an accident, right? We don't invest, first of all, as I said before, the system of residential caste we have is such that in many major cities, it is illegal to build anything other than a large detached home on 75% of the land, right? So the, 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 the laws are designed for a, only a slither of the population, only a person who can afford that lifestyle. And everybody else be damned, right? Uh, so there's that. Then there's also this, Anti-black fear is what animates almost all of the policies that shape what gets built, right? So, you know, the, the, if, if we try to repeal exclusionary zoning or say, okay, we're going to have a lot more housing, a lot more affordable housing, different types of housing, quadplexes, right? <laughs> Apartments, micro housing, you know. Um, the vested interest of people who live in those areas, the 75% of land which is zoned just for them, is like, hell no, right? And again, you know, I, I, Trump is nothing if not transparent. I at least appreciate that he's honest, vulgarly transparent. He's running in 2020 and says, you can thank me for protecting your suburban white dream, you know, right? So that it, it, it's all bound up. We, we devalue uh, and fear black people, but, uh, but frankly, it's, the story is more about overvaluing the interests and demands of elites. But the hundred years of policy that I glossed over is, is mainly about shaping the desires and, and catering to the desires of whites even middle income whites. Like here, you get your majority white suburban dream that others are cut out of. We're, we're gonna construct this for you. Um, and, and you know, surprise, surprise, people resist anything else, right? And so, you know, homelessness is an outgrowth of all of that. I hope that's responsive. John, you wanna add anything to that? Sure. These are complicated problems or issues and we can't do them just in such in a short period of time. Here in California, and Stephen knows this I think better than um, most, he does a lot of work on housing, we're about three million units short of housing. Three million units. Three million units, that's the state. Uh, we're not building housing. And then when, when we do build it, we build it in the wrong place. We don't build it close to transportation. 
So why don't we build housing? And some of the things that Cheryl talked about. So the problem in some ways is not that hard. Uh, now, it's complicated because frankly, I think we are divided as well. So housing advocates, some of them think the way you actually get rid of, because if you look at homelessness, it's actually more than one thing. And you know this as a homeless advocate. Uh, it used to be more in line with what Cheryl just said. Recently, in Seattle and, and the Bay Area, more and more middle class people without mental problems are becoming homeless and unhoused and underhoused, living in, in R, uh, RVs. So start off as a small problem, sex expanding further and further. And we're, the, the, the rate in which we're trying to change is being outstripped by the problem. The problem's going faster. Um, we're here in Berkeley. It's hard to find a house in Berkeley, any house in Berkeley, including a teardown under a million dollars. That's gonna, you know, we try to hire faculty here. They say, you know, uh, Denise, they say, you know, we have this little housing program. They say, great, you know, you're gonna help me with $50,000, $100,000, great, I'm coming from Cleveland. And then they say, but the house, modest house that you want is gonna cost $1.5 million and you're getting, your salary won't support that. Uh, so the problem is huge, but it's a very powerful, strong market. The, the realtor lobbyist is one of the strongest lobbyists in the country. Uh, the problem from a technical perspective is easy to solve. The problem from a political perspective is impossible to solve. So, uh, so we're dealing with both of those things at the same time. And the housing issue, it's largely migrated into, from just bricks and mortar to also a credit problem. Uh, look at the subprime lending. That was all about global credit chasing and the dictating the housing market. We haven't kept up with that. But it's solvable, at least in terms of policy, technically. But the politics of it, it's a hot mess. Stephen? Well, I, I want to bridge that last question with one of the questions we got online. But also note, there was a, a phenomenal segment John Oliver did this week on homelessness. And one of the things that comes out so vividly in your book, Cheryl, is that every single time a community is debating an affordable housing development, a policy, a plan, the public opposition is so intense, almost ubiquitous, historical, contemporary in Marin. There's the famous development that George Lucas was supporting. In San Francisco, the, the homelessness, um, I forget what they were called, coordination centers. But what's almost always the case in every single one of those instances is that there's a racial coding to it about, about crime, about um, drugs, all these, all these sorts of things are layered into it. It's, so one of the things that, that you've also written about separately, Cheryl, in uh, Place Not Race, very skeptically, of, and, and somewhat here too as well, very skeptically of place-based strategies. So you lift up the, pretty much the success that mobility strategies have had, much more skeptical of sort of um, targeted and, and really robust directed investments in places that are low opportunity. Um, but, we, but as you also recognize, we have to do both. So one of the questions online is a really good question, and I think you, you touch on it in a couple places in your book, can you discuss how to bring public investments to impoverished neighborhoods without causing displacement and gentrification? Are there any models you can highlight? And not only that, how do you make sure that these developments benefit locals? I always try to take on the hardest questions, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what engineers do, right? So. Um, you, you see, I've evolved a bit, yeah. right? So in, 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 in my chapter, Abolition and Repair, I prioritize investing in historically defunded black neighborhoods, right? And, and, and I say, it may, it's a moral matter, the state is obligated to repair what it still breaks, right? And so I argue that um, neighborhoods that have been traumatized you, the, the history is not long ago. You can say they should get, they should be first in line 
for new infrastructure dollars, right? Uh, descendants, ki any kid in apartheid schools, right? They, they should get, you know, more, extra, right? The bus routes from the poor neighborhoods should be free. Community colleges, you know, if you can't do it for everybody, make it free for, for, for people trapped in the hood, right? I could go on, right? Universal basic income, which, you know, is, uh, Mike, what's his name? The mayor from Stockton, who's, who, right, right, I mean, but you know, that I, I could go on. Now, but when it comes to housing, um, yeah, the minute you solve violence problems in high poverty neighborhoods, or you start to green line those neighborhoods and give them more and nicer, yeah, people are gonna go there because it's cheaper and now it's safe. So. I, I'm really into and, per, and per talk about um, collective ownership strategies. S I feature some places that are doing this. It's going on in a number of places where you need to transfer assets to trusted community institutions that um, can own rental properties and make sure that they remain in perpetuity uh, available and affordable to low-income people, and also institutions that are about the business of retaining culture, right, um, as you go forward, right? But, but the fear of gentrification is not an argument for not giving <coughs> historically defunded neighborhoods their fair share of, of, of resources. Let me just add mm -hmm. two things, that I Stephen. One, there are a number of, ex of examples, and I was not standing Robert Sampson, um, of neighborhoods being invested in, but the people then get pushed out. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the neighborhoods. You right. want to make sure that the people there uh, actually benefit from the investments. Um, for years, there's uh, an area in Portland where they tried to invest in neighborhoods, and they finally did. And, they, and it's, it's beautiful. A friend of mine lives there now. Uh, she was, it was a Latino neighborhood. She's now thinking about leaving because she's the lone Latino still living there. Uh, and they used to call, the, they, they put in bike lanes and the people in the neighborhood call them white lanes. Um, so it's not just investing in space, you have to actually think about people. The focus has to be on people, not place, not mobility, but people. Uh, and the politics of that is fierce because the people who are living in those hoarded neighborhoods play the political game very well. Uh, so that's why I say it's not a hard technical problem, it's a hard political problem. Uh, and then there's another wrinkle that actually adds to this as well, private investment. So if you're getting ready to open up a grocery store, on its own, would you open it up in an area that's high income or low income? There's a pull for high income, right? Because people have more disposable income. So it becomes a perpetuating cycle. So you have to do something to disrupt that. So the, the, the private investment is likely to chase the same kind of neighborhoods where investment is already hoarded. So you have all these multiple layers uh, that you have to sort of at least have a handle in on at the same time. Uh, and, and just focusing on one probably won't work. Uh, we have time to get a couple more questions in, and then I'm going to ask a question on solutions to wrap us up. We got a bunch more online, too. Um, one just note, though, is there's a big fight in Oakland right now around the Oakland A's athletic stadium, much like these other. And, you know, the Oakland has lost the NBA team, the NFL team, and now is being threatened. The, o the A's have been threatening to leave if they don't get their waterfront development. Part of the fight is around the percentage of affordable housing that should be part of the development. But part of it also is all these other issues of billionaires, you know, hat in hand asking for subsidies. Um, on the social housing question, uh, one of the researchers in the room, Eli, uh, Moore at the Institute sent me uh, a chart last week that reminded me, I'd forgotten about this, that uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program has a home ownership sub-program within it. It's not just for rentals, but it's essentially for home. The number of units in the Bay Area that that program has, has um, increased is basically zero in 20 years. It's the same flat, so there's great need, and these programs, if they could be scaled up, could be immensely um, helpful. All right, uh, I saw a few more questions. Let's start over here, Mark. Question right over here. 
Hello. Um, thank you for this conversation. My name is Brandy Summers, uh, and I teach in the geography department. And so it's interesting to talk about geography with a law professor. So I'm um, really interested not only in the conversation that's happened this afternoon, because I have a lot of thoughts about them, especially around gentrification and housing, but in particular, um, in thinking, Cheryl, about how you're saying geography is crucial now to think about um, anti-blackness in meaningful ways, isn't it always been, hasn't geography always been um, and really important to creating essentially anti-blackness if we're thinking about the plantation, if we're thinking about the location of plantations, but then also zipping through Jim Crow urban renewal, which again, I imagine you trace, but just geography really contributing to the conditions under which we understand how black people exist um, in ways that racialization changes based on space or based on what's considered urban versus suburban, rural, et cetera. So I'd love to hear more about how I guess the spatial focus, especially in thinking about policy, might differ from this longer term understanding of how geography is integral to um, anti-black racism here. So I recognize you from Twitter. Nice to see you in person. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's just so funny. You like see these people and you like tweet with them and then there they are. They actually are real. Um, so thank you for that. So the, 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 here's the thing. Yes, absolutely. There's been, there, there's a persistent story that for hundreds of years about geography and blackness. But what, what's distinctive is beginning in the 10s and 20s, what gets constructed uh, outside the South, right? As black people move from one system of social containment. In Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South, there wasn't the, you see this in, in um, the, the man from Princeton, who write, he, Sharky. Doug Massey, you see this in Doug Massey's work, right? Right. Um, sorry, I'm getting old. Um, it, 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 in the South, there wasn't that much dissimilarity. You know, blacks and whites lived actually in close proximity, um, but you had Jim Crow was a mechanism of social, you know, suppression, right? Residence becomes the mechanism of social containment elsewhere. So that, that's what's distinctive. It, you know, it's interesting, if you look at ta Coates' uh, seminal piece on reparations, he spends more time on housing in the 20th century than he actually does on slavery. So it, it, as I said before, the dominant experience for black Americans in their uh, access or lack thereof to opportunity has been one of residential segregation, right? Even so-called high-income black people tend to live in more modest um, uh, opportunity places than, than white people who make much less than them. So that's why, that's what's distinct about it. It it's, it's becomes really, really marked in the 20th century and, and it is the main mechanism, I believe, of, of uh, defining who gets opportunity and who doesn't today. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's exactly right. And the caveat, think about it. Before transportation, you had to live close to where you work. And so blacks in the South had to actually live. If you go, to, I don't know if you're from the South, but you go to the South, you see plantations and blacks always lived on the plantation. They lived within walking distance to work. Um, and with cars, you now can have people live a long way and with public transportation as bad as it is, it created a new mechanism. So it is quite different. The, the physical space is much greater today than it was back then. The social space back then did the work. So blacks and whites lived next to each other, but the social line was very clear. So you had the white drinking fountain and the black drinking fountain right next to each other. Now you have the white drinking fountain over here and the black drinking fountain 10 miles away. Well, we got a lot of questions online. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get through all of them. And you should have uh, typed them in faster and earlier. But <laughs> let's, uh, let's at least get to this one. Um, and maybe one more question from the audience, if we have time. And then I'll wrap up with one question on solutions. What, so John is, is one of your mentors was Derek Bell, who I think is safe to say was one of the fathers, so to speak, of, of critical race theory. Um, 
And critical race theory obviously has been hijacked by the right wing, has become a boogeyman, has become a, a, a frame for scaring people. The question here is what can we say in two minutes at a school board meeting to effectively present? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say the question was, it was easy. Um, to effectively present a different conversation than the CRT message being pushed by conservative folks, Ann Randall. Rundle. Well, two things. I think, one, we have to get out of binaries. It's not either or. Uh, we have to be willing to embrace complexity, which a two-minute answer does not allow us to do. Um, and we have to make clear um, that um, in talking about American history, like any history, we have good things and bad things. We only learn from dealing with it all. We don't want to paint it that it's all good. That's what they say, that we can't talk about slavery, that makes us feel bad. Think of how to make the slaves feel. <laughs> you know, so it's like, so deal with it. And, and there is a little bit of a thing that happens. So the conservatives paint this picture, it's the greatest country that ever lived, you know, everything's wonderful. And you know, frankly, progressives do just the opposite. There's nothing good about this country. Both of those seem to me somewhat problematic and somewhat narrow. Um, it's a complicated process. But more importantly, we actually trying to construct a future where we all belong. And we can only do that by looking at how we're situated and how we got there. Uh, and it's not a question of necessarily guilt, but it is a question of responsibility. So uh, that would be my two-minute two answer. Sure. Well, I, I, I say this to my students. I actually participated in a debate for the Federalist Society with a guy who was, has, is suing school districts on the behalf of white plaintiffs, right? So, I, you know, I, and, and what I said was, first of all, CRT is not being taught in schools. Um, second of all, there are two main ideas behind CRT you know, where it is taught in law schools and other places. One is that um, racism is embedded in law, and that's true. And then I just listed, I just, it took me up, it took me like 30 seconds to list a lot of policies where it's obvious, right? And then second uh, main premise of CRT is that the civil rights revolution, which is, was mainly an anti-discrimination revolution of giving people individual rights to sue, was, has not been effective in undermining systemic racism. And that's too, true, true too, you know? Um, and then I say, you know, I taught to ta teach my sons, I teach my law students that the American story is one of this dance between our beautiful self-evident truths um, and fighting the ideology that set slavery in motion, right? And it's a beautiful story. And, I, and there are heroes and there are villains and there are complicated people. Thomas Jefferson embodies the complication, right? And you know, but I hold up my heroes. A lot of them are white, radical Republicans. Right, Thaddeus Stevens. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, you know there are these, there are there are heroes of all uh, colors. And the thing that gives me the most hope about this country is that the coalition of multiracial allies who are fighting to make our self self evident truth actually true for people in their daily lives is growing. Right, you know I don't demonize white people. You know they they they're they're a big part of the coalition. Right, and so I just. That's what I say, I tell that story, right? And I like this notion of like, well, do you want the, the, the white supremacists to win? You know, is that what you, you want your kid to believe in white supremacy? I don't know, I might try some of that turning. You know? <laughs> that was clever. Well, we're just about out of time. I'm gonna ask, I, I can't let us go without asking about solutions. Um, but before I do that, because I know we'll close immediately after that, um, Cheryl will be signing copies of her book. We have a bookseller in the back. Mm -hmm. So if there are questions that you didn't get a chance to answer, get, get answered, please approach her or, or any of us afterwards and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that. Can but, I make one minor intention? Sure. So um, the two people here uh, have been holding up the hands since the very beginning. Um, so if we can get both of the questions. Okay, we let's do that. Let's do that popcorn style and then I'll ask the solution question. But hold Testing. your answers, though, until we get both questions. Go ahead. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jabari Mahiri. I'm a professor here 
I'm tenured and I say that because uh, it's a part of the question that I want to ask. And uh, the question that I want to ask has to do with, I think we've touched on this issue, but can we really destroy white supremacy without serious disruption of capitalism? And I say that to say, um, as a tenure professor, I could argue, well, one of the things we want to do is get more people in the professoriate and more people tenured. But tenure itself is a part of the feudal system that manifests the inequities in how resources are distributed <coughs> in the university as a reflection of how it's re uh, distributed uh, inequitably in the society. So capitalism, for me, is a word that has not come up today. And I just want the uh, panelists to, to talk about how that might actually precede issues of inequity in space. And, and the other question, please? Okay. Yeah, can you grab the mic? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, my name is Marla. I worked in Baltimore for many years doing education advocacy and so housing and education, specifically school funding for, formulas are just inextricably linked together. Um, and so what we advocated for in Baltimore for many years is a multiplier for students that are living in concentration, concentrated poverty. Um, because you go to some schools in Baltimore and it's 80, 90 percent of students living in poverty. Um, and we have a per pupil um, funding system that is throughout. And I just wanted to ask a question of how do we um, have this conversation at schools where pe folks who are responsible for funding schools understand where students are in this process. If I could take that one up really quickly. Um, I don't know if you've been following the uh, Kirwan mm -hmm. uh, funding. So the, that message seems to have gotten through, right? right? Um, the legislature has passed this $4 billion plan. And as I understand it, the legislation includes a provision that high poverty places should get more. Um, it's probably not going to be enough, but at least the politics in Maryland, uh, and I think they had to override Hogan's veto in order to do that. Right, 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 right. Thank you. Right. It's been a while since I finished it. Okay, so that that's what's exciting, right? You know, in uh, so-called blue states or so-called progressive progressive cities, progressive states. I do think there is a critical mass of white people who wants to be part of the coalition and is down with, yes, more racial equity, yes, less racial oppression. You know, uh, we can argue about the details, but um, uh, we're getting better uh, and there's more possibility for achieving that. Uh, I, can't, I, I can't briefly speak to your, your, your question. It's just way too complicated for, you know, for, for me to speak briefly to it. But what I, what I would say is, I, in this book, I had to fight my battles, I, had, I picked my battle, and my goal in this book was to tell the story of persistent anti-black oppression manifesting in residential caste and how we're all trapped in it. And that's what I set out to do in this book. <laughs> that may be a different book. <laughs> So I, I definitely obviously think capitalism is a problem, but I don't, don't think capitalism is a thing. Capitalism, there are many different expressions of capitalism. Uh, we only have to look at our neighbors north of us. Their school system is funded completely different than ours at a national level. Um, their friends like Tony Iden over at California Endowment, he said when he came here, he's African, he's, he's Canadian, but he's, uh, well, anyway, he's black, let me just say that. <laughs> 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 he said when he came to Baltimore to go to Johns Hopkins because he's a doctor, he said he asked, when was the war here? Uh, he hadn't seen anything like that. And I'm not saying Canada is perfect, but it is capitalist. And so I, I think we should look at these systems hard, but I don't want to load it up so heavy that until we resolve all the problems, we can't resolve some of the problems. Um, so we can do better, and eventually we will bump up into uh, different expressions of capitalism. But th again, it's all around the world. Uh, countries are on that spectrum of capitalism and most of them don't have the quite, I mean, England is the closest to us in many ways. And you look at the number of people who are killed by the police in England, it's 
almost nothing compared to the United States. Uh, and it's still a capitalist country. So it's not capitalism doesn't explain everything, but it is important. So we're, we're really out of time. I, I, want, I want to ask this last question of you, and then we'll, we'll leave. I think we got to six questions in the audience, two online, and we have a stack more, and I'm sure a lot of you have questions we didn't get to. But one of the things that's apparent in, in books like yours, Cheryl, is that they're long on the problem and short on solution. I think you have a, a wonderful chapter called Abolition and Repair, and although you're not super explicit about it, I counted at least 22 implied policy or process recommendations that you think could help really begin to turn the corner on systemic racism in this country. I'm wondering if both of you, starting with you, Cheryl, could just maybe list off your top two or three recommendations of things that would really put us on the path to remedy and solution, or repair as you put it. Okay, so the main goal from the outset, the, the our overarching principles, right? You want to disrupt the three anti-black processes. So um, boundary maintenance. My number one policy goal is mandatory inclusionary zoning, hmm. right? Instead of exclusionary zoning. And I hold up some examples. Minneapolis repealed its single family zoning ordinance. California only opened up single family neighborhoods to duplexes. Right, that's okay, but it, so mandatory exclusionary, inclusionary zoning. Every neighborhood should have its fair share in new development of some low income units, okay? Opportunity hoarding, my number one proposal is racial equity analysis or neighborhood analysis, right? Um, Baltimore, Minneapolis, and Seattle have laws which require a neighborhood analysis where you're actually looking at where the dollars have been going and you, you, you try to achieve more racial equity in allocating resources going forward, right? And that is what the Biden's um, racial equity analysis he is, is about. So that's that. And then stereotype-driven surveillance. I'm not an expert on, on, on policing, but, but uh, my number one policy proposal is the one created by this man back in the corner, the right? The Office of Neighborhood uh, Safety and um, Peacemaker Fellowships. And if you want to learn about it, go to advancepeace.org, right? Um, how many cities are y'all up in now? Okay, Amazing. so there you are. John, you want to add anything? Again, I, I, would, <laughs> I, I would support all of those, um, and maybe it was with a, two caveats or two additions. One would be, um, I think we have to be, we actually put something called target universalism. So one of the things that the, the, the law has actually pushed us is to not name race. Um, and when we do, it's like they go crazy, especially if you're naming in favor of people of color. When you, when you do it in favor of whites, they're more quiet. Uh, and, and I think, so we not actually have to be able to name the populations we're trying to serve. And I don't think that just means black people, but I think it's to be weighted in terms of black people. Uh, so, um, so I believe, for example, if we just do affordable housing, they'll find a way to make sure that black people are left out. Uh, and so I think we have to really be specific as, and so part of that and is, is a what I'd call a belonging or racial audit for different groups how money is spent outcomes not inputs so not who's getting money but out in how it's being used how it's changing with clear goals uh, closing the racial what's called people call the racial wealth gap uh, but anyway I think having the numbers the data to show how different groups are situated in terms of opportunity and where we're trying to get to would be something that I would support Great, and we'll stop there. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you all.